Chapter 13, How Populations Evolve. This is the beginning of Biology 2. And here are the big ideas for this chapter. So we're going to cover Darwin's theory of evolution, the evolution of populations, and the mechanisms of microevolution. So let's start with Darwin's theory of evolution. Charles Darwin is best known for the book that he wrote on the origin of species by means of natural selection. Most of the time, it's commonly referred to as just the origin of species. This launched the era of evolutionary biology. And when Darwin started out, his early career gave no indication of his future fame. He enrolled in and then left medical school. Then he entered Cambridge University to become a clergyman. At the age of 22, he took a position on the HMS Beagle, which was a ship preparing for a long expedition to chart very poorly known stretches of the South American coast. As the ship's resident field biologist, Darwin spent most of his time on the shore collecting thousands of specimens of fossils and living plants and animals, and he kept very detailed notes of all of his observations. So this map just gives you an idea of how much traveling was done by Darwin. And probably when you think of Darwin, you most often think about the Galapagos Islands, which would be here. And there's the Beagle in port. So many of Darwin's observations indicated that geographic proximity, so being close to one another, is a better predictor of the relationships among organisms than the similarity of the environment. And Darwin was particularly interested by the geographic distribution of organisms on the Galapagos Islands, including the marine iguanas and the giant tortoises. So here's a view of the Galapagos Island and the marine iguana which is kind of awesome, and also the giant tortoise, which is most definitely awesome. When he was on his voyage, Darwin was strongly influenced by the newly published Principles of Geology by Scottish geologist Charles Lyell. This book presented the case for an ancient earth that was sculpted over millions of years by gradual geologic processes that continue today. As he reflected on his own observations and analyzed his collections and talked about his work with other colleagues, he concluded that the evidence was better explained by the hypothesis that present-day creatures or species are the descendants of an ancient ancestors or, or of ancient ancestors that they still resemble in some ways. He hypothesized that as the descendants of a remote ancestor spread into various habitats over millions and millions of years, and that they accumulated modifications or adaptations that fit them to specific ways of life in their personal environments. By the early 1840s, Darwin had composed a long essay describing the major features of his theory of evolution by natural selection. But he didn't publish his essay yet. He continued to compile more evidence in support of his hypothesis and finally released his essay to the scientific community when he learned about the work of another British naturalist, Alfred Wallace, who had a nearly identical hypothesis. Scientists typically regard Darwin's concept of evolution by means of natural selection as a theory, which is a widely accepted explanatory idea 
that is broader in scope than a hypothesis. It can generate new hypotheses and is supported by a large body of evidence. So next we're going to look at lines of evidence for Darwin's theory of evolution. The idea that living species are descendants of ancestral species that were different from present day ones and that natural selection specifically is the mechanism for evolutionary change. So let's look at fossils first. So fossils are the imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past. And they can document differences between the past and present organisms and reveal that many species have become extinct. Some fossils are not the actual remains of the organism. The 375 million year old fossils in the next picture we're going to look at are casts of ammonites, which are shelled marine animals that are related to what we have now, present day, known as the nautilus. The nautilus is a marine mollusk. So here's the fossil of the ammonite, which were shelled marine animals as well. The sequence in which fossils appear within strata, which strata are layers of rocks, is a historical record of life on Earth. Paleontologists, which are scientists who specialize in studying fossils, can gain access to very old fossils when erosion carves through upper, which would be younger strata, revealing deeper or older strata that had been buried. So in this image, you can see clearly the layers of strata, the youngest being close to the top and the oldest being near the bottom. The fossil record is known as the chronicle of evolution over millions of years of geologic time, engraved in the order in which fossils appear in the rock strata. The fossil record is incomplete because many of Earth's organisms did not live in areas that favor fossilization. The fossils that did form were often in rocks later distorted or destroyed by geologic processes, and not all fossils that have been preserved are accessible to paleontologists. In The Origin of Species, Darwin predicted that the existence of fossils in what he called transitional forms would link very different groups of, of organisms. For example, if his hypothesis that whales evolved from land-dwelling mammals was correct, then a fossil should show a series of changes or the transitional forms in a lineage of mammals adapted to a fully aquatic habitat. In other words, there should be a fossil there should be fossils that show the changes that happened from land-dwelling mammals to become fully aquatic mammals. Evolution is a, is a process of descent with modifications over time. Characteristics present in an ancestral organism are altered over time by natural selection. As the descendants of that ancestor face different environmental challenges or conditions. Evolution can be thought of as change or a remodeling process. Related species can have characteristics that have an underlying similarity but function very differently. Similarity resulting from common ancestry is known as homology. Darwin cited the anatomical similarities among vertebrate forelimbs as evidence of common ancestry. We're going to look at a figure in just a second that's going to show the skeletal elements of the forelimbs of humans, cats, whales, and bats. But the functions of these differ greatly. Biologists call these anatomical similarities in different organisms homologous structures. So here we see the human forelimbs, the cat, 
four limbs. You can look at the humerus here and the humerus here. This would be your upper arm bone. Similar. And then as we transition, humerus, humerus, and you can see that these definitely, though there are, they're similar in appearance, there's definitely different functions between, say, a human arm and a bat wing. Molecular comparisons between diverse groups of organisms have allowed biologists to develop hypotheses about the evolutionary divergence of major branches on the tree of life. Darwin's boldest hypothesis was that all life forms are related. Molecular biology provides some evidence for this claim. So all forms of life use the same genetic language of DNA and RNA, which is something you covered extensively in Bio 1. The genetic code, how RNA triplets are translated into amino acids, is universal amongst living things. An understanding of homology helps explain why early stages of development in different animal species reveal similarities not visible in adult organisms. Darwin was the first to view the history of life as a tree with multiple branches from a common ancestral trunk to the descendant species at the tips of the twigs. Today biologists represent these patterns with an evolutionary tree typically turned sideways. So I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Homologous structures can be used to determine the branching sequence of an evolutionary tree. And these homologies can include the anatomical structure and or the molecular structure of the organism. So here's a modern evolutionary tree. And each branch point is going to represent the common ancestor of the lineage beginning there and to the right. Darwin's greatest contribution to biology was his explanation of how life will evolve. He thought that species formed gradually over long periods of time, so he knew he would not be able to study the evolution of new species by direct observation. But insights into how change happens incrementally could be seen in examples of artificial selection, where humans have modified species through selective breeding. So this is artificial because humans are doing it. Darwin knew that individuals and in natural populations have small but measurable differences. What forces in nature play the role of the breeder choosing which individuals become the breeding stock for the next generation? Darwin found some help with this in an essay written by economist Thomas Malthus who contended that much of human suffering is because of disease, famine, and war, and was the consequence of human populations increasing faster than the food supply and other resources. Darwin then deduced that the production of more individuals than, than the limited resources we, we have and can support those organisms on will lead to a struggle for existence, with only some offspring surviving in each generation. So this is where we've heard before survival of the fittest or the strong survive. The essence of natural selection is this unequal reproduction. Individuals whose traits better enable them to get away or escape from predators to better get food or tolerate physical conditions, these guys will survive and be the ones that reproduce more successfully, passing these adaptive, strong traits to their offspring. Darwin reasoned that if artificial selection can bring about so much change in a relatively short period of time, then natural selection can modify species considerably over hundreds or thousands of generations. So it's important to emphasize three key points about evolution by natural selection. 
Although natural selection occurs through interactions between individual organisms and the environment, individuals themselves do not evolve. Rather, it's the entire population, the whole group of organisms, that will evolve over time. Natural selection can amplify or diminish only heritable traits. Evolution is not goal-directed, so it doesn't lead to perfectly adapted organisms. Biologists have documented some of this evolutionary change in thousands of scientific studies. Peter and Rosemary Grant have worked on Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Islands for over 30 years. They found that in dry years, large, strong beaks are favored in the finches because all seeds are in short supply and the birds must eat more larger seeds. But in wet years, small seeds are more abundant and small beaks are favored. Another example of this natural selection in action is the evolution of pesticide resistance in insects. So a relatively small amount of poison initially will kill most of the insects, but subsequent applications of the poison are less and less effective. The few survivors are individuals that are genetically resistant or more tough, carrying an allele that somehow enables them to survive the chemical attack. When these resistant insects reproduce, the percentage of the population resistant to the pesticide increases. Let's look at that in this example. So here we have these insects with their allele highlighted. Okay, so we're just talking about one of two or more forms of a gene when we're talking about alleles. So you can see that we've got some insects here with their alleles highlighted green, and we've got a couple that are highlighted red. So these guys get poisoned with pesticides, and you can see that everybody dies except for these two survivors with the red allele. So because these guys are the only ones left, they will reproduce to produce offspring that are more resistant against that pesticide, and on and on. These examples of evolutionary adaptation highlight two very important points about natural selection. You can think of natural selection as more of an editing process than a creative mechanism. Natural selection is contingent on time and place and will favor heritable traits in a varying population that will fit the current local environment. Okay, so transitioning to the evolution of populations. Organisms typically show individual variation. However, in The Origin of Species, Darwin could not explain the cause of the variation among the individuals or how those variations were passed from parents to offspring. Just a few years after the publication of The Origin of Species, Gregor Mendel, which you should remember from Biology 1, wrote a groundbreaking paper on the inheritance in pea plants. Mendel's work was not really recognized during his or Darwin's lifetime. Its rediscovery in 1900 set the stage for understanding the genetic differences on which evolution is based. Each person has a unique genome. This is a complete set of genes in an organism, reflected in individual phenotypic variations, such as your appearance and other traits. Individual variation, though, does occur in all species. Mutations are changes in the nucleotide sequence of DNA and are the ultimate source of new alleles. Remember, alleles are one of two or more forms of a gene. Thus, mutation is the ultimate source of the genetic variation that gives us raw material for evolution. A change as small as a single nucleotide in a protein coding gene can have a significant effect on phenotype. And remember, phenotype is what we express as a result of our genes, as in sickle cell disease. 
On rare occasions, however, a mutated allele may actually improve the adaptation of an individual to the environment and enhance its reproductive success. This kind of effect is more likely when the environment is changing such that mutations were once disadvantageous are now favorable under these new conditions. Chromosomal duplication is an important source of genetic variation. If a repeated segment of DNA can persist over generations, mutations can accumulate in the duplicate copies without really affecting the function of the original gene, eventually leading to new genes with really cool and new functions. For example, the remote ancestors of mammals that carried a single gene for detecting odors has since been duplicated repeatedly. So as a result, mice have about 1,300 different olfactory or scent receptor genes. In organisms that reproduce sexually, most of the genetic variation in a population will result from the unique combination of alleles that each individual inherits. A population is defined as a group of individuals of the same species that live in the same area and interbreed. We can measure evolution as a change in the prevalence of certain heritable traits in a population but it's over a span of generations. Different populations of the same species may be geographically isolated from each other to such an extent that an exchange of genetic material never occurs or often occurs only rarely. Such isolation is common in populations confined to different lakes. So you can see here that species could be separated geographically, meaning that the creatures that are reproducing here are not going to mix genes with the creatures reproducing here. Geographic isolation. A gene pool consists of all copies of every type of allele at every locus in all members of the population. Microevolution is the change in the relative frequency of those alleles in a population over a number of generations, and is evolution occurring on its tiniest scale. To understand how microevolution works, we're going to look at a simple population in which evolution is not occurring and thus the gene pool is not changing. So, in order to do that, we're going to have to imagine this population. So imaginary population of iguanas with individuals that differ in foot webbing. So we're going to assume that foot webbing is controlled by a single gene and the allele for non-webbed feet, okay, non-webbed feet, capital W, which we learned in biology one, this is a dominant gene, okay, so W dominant gene for non-webbing is completely dominant to the allele for the webbed feet. So webbed feet, little w, recessive. Okay. So here's our non-webbed iguana, and then you can see the webbed iguana. So the shuffling of alleles that will accompany sexual reproduction does not alter the genetic makeup of the population in this scenario. So no matter how many times these alleles are segregated into different gametes, which is the egg or the sperm, and united in different combinations by fertilization, the frequency of each allele in the gene pool will continue to remain constant unless other factors are operating. This balance or equilibrium is the Hardy-Weinberg principle named for two scientists who derived it independently in 1908. To test out the Hardy-Weinberg principle, we're going to look at these two generations of our imaginary iguana population. Okay, so we're going to look at a figure that's going to show the frequency of alleles in the gene pool of the original population, and then from, from those genotype frequencies, we can calculate the frequency of each allele in the population. 
Okay, so this is our Hardy Weinberg equation here. So here are our phenotypes. We have non webbed and non webbed. And you can see that the genes that give us non webbed are two dominant W genes. Or we could just have one dominant W and one recessive W. We would still be non webbed. Recessive webbed, our genotype is small w, small w. Okay, so in our imaginary population, there are 500 iguanas total. 320 have two dominant w's. 160 have a dominant w and a recessive w. 20 of them have two recessive W's and exhibit webbing. So how do we determine the frequency of genes? So our genotype frequency, we're going to take the 320 dominant W's and divide that by the total population of 500. And that will give us 0.64 or around 64% of our population are going to be genotype capital W, capital W. 160 of our heterozygous group here, the capital W and the lowercase w, non-webbed, 160 divided by the total population of 500 equals 0.32 or 32% will have a heterozygous pairing. 20 of 500, so 20 divided by 500, 0.04, only 4% will show webbing and carry both recessive genes. So the number of alleles in the gene pool totals 1,000. We have 500 animals, and each of those animals carry two alleles. So that gives us our 1,000. Okay, so 320 out of the 500 animals, 320 dominant W's. Because these guys have two dominant W's, we're going to double that number to 640 dominant W's. 160 dominant W's, or 160 of these animals have the heterozygous dominant W recessive W. So 160 dominant W's, we're gonna add that to our 640, giving us a total of 800 dominant W's. There are 160 recessive W's with this group. There are 20 animals with the homozygous recessive traits, two small w's. So since we've got 20 animals with two small w's, that means we've got 40 small w's, okay, or recessive traits. So we're going to add that 40 to the 160 alleles of small w's that we got from this group, which gives us a total of 200. So 800 alleles of dominant W and 200 alleles of recessive W. 800 divided by 1,000 equals 0.8, or 80% of the creatures will have a dominant W. It could be like this, or it could be like this. 200 divided by 1,000 equals 0.2, or 20%. Recessive. So 20% will carry a recessive allele for webbing. So we can use this information to do a Punnett square that uses these gamete allele frequencies and the rule of multiplication to try and calculate the frequencies of the three genotypes in the next generation. Because the genotype frequencies are the same as in the parent population, 
the allele frequencies P and Q are also the same. So P is the dominant allele and Q is the recessive allele. Thus, the gene pool of this population is in a state of equilibrium, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So let's take a look at this Punnett square. All right, so the egg possibilities are dominant W or recessive W. So we're putting our dominant here and our recessive here. Remember, P is dominant and Q is recessive. And we figured out in our last um, chart that we had a 0.8 or 80% possibility of carrying a dominant W and a 0.2 or 20% possibility of carrying a small W or recessive. So you can see those numbers here, 0 0.8 and 0 0.2. The sperm options are dominant W or recessive W. So those are the only options we've got. When we draw our square, we then compare. So if this option, we combine dominant W and dominant W, that gives us dominant W, dominant W, we're not going to have webbing. Okay, we can also multiply our numbers. So 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 equals 0.64. So there's a 64% chance we're going to have a dominant, dominant animal with no webbing. So let's combine this possibility. So dominant W, recessive W, and that gives us PQ. So dominant recessive, we multiply 0 0.8 by 0 0.2. That gives us 16% chance that we will have a creature that carries the recessive gene, but we're still not going to be webbed. And let's try this combination. So recessive W and dominant W. And again, that's a 0.16, so 0.2 and 0.8 a 16% chance that we will have a creature carrying a dominant W and a recessive W. And then finally, our recessive W egg and our recessive W sperm, so two recessives, is Q squared, so recessive squared, so 0 0.2 and 0 0.2, 0 0.2 times 0.2 gives us 0.04 which is a 4% chance that we are going to have a creature with webbing. So the next generation, the allele frequencies are 0 0.64, double dominant or homozygous, 0 0.32, heterozygous, dominant recessive. If we add those together, these guys are both going to be webbed. Excuse me, they're both going to be non-webbed which gives us a 0.8 chance of being webbed, or 80%, and a 20% chance, or 0.2, for showing webbing. So this imaginary population is in equilibrium. If a population is in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, Allele and genotype frequencies will remain constant, generation after generation. The Hardy-Weinberg principle tells us that something other than the reshuffling processes of sexual reproduction is going to be required to change up the allele frequencies in a population. For a population to be and stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it must satisfy five main conditions. There must be a very large population and no gene flow between populations. No mutations, random mating, and no natural selection. So obviously, rarely are all five conditions met in real populations. And thus, allele and genotype frequencies often do change. The Hardy-Weinberg equation can be used to test whether evolution is occurring in a population. So next we'll transition to mechanisms of microevolution.
If the five conditions for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are not met in a population, the allele frequencies will change. However, mutations are rare and random and have little effect on the gene pool, and non-random mating can change the genotype frequencies but usually has little impact on the allele frequencies. Three main causes of evolutionary change are natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. Natural selection first. If individuals differ in their survival and reproductive success, natural selection will alter their allele frequencies. So if we think about our imaginary iguana population, individuals with webbed feet, remember that was genotype WW, might survive better and produce more offspring because they're more efficient at swimming and catching food than individuals that lack webbed feet. Genetic equilibrium would be disturbed as the frequency of the W, small w allele increased in the gene pool from one generation to the next. Genetic drift. So genetic drift is a process where chance events can cause allele frequencies to fluctuate unpredictably from one generation to the next. The smaller the population, the more impact genetic drift is likely to have. Catastrophes like hurricanes, floods, or fires can kill large number, numbers of individuals leaving a small surviving population that is unlikely to have the same exact genetic makeup as the original group. The bottleneck effect leads to a loss of genetic diversity when a population is greatly reduced like this. So similar to shaking just a few marbles through a bottleneck, certain alleles may be present at higher frequency in the surviving population than in the original population. Others may be present at lower frequency, and some, like the orange marbles in our next image, may not be present at all. After a population is drastically reduced, genetic drift may continue for many generations until the population is again large enough for fluctuations due to chance to have less of an impact. So here's our original population and then the bottlenecking event where there can be a catastrophe or a killing of large numbers of individuals. This is going to only leave small surviving population. And you can see that because they're of the large kill off or in this example as we're pouring the marbles out we're getting a whole lot of purple. So the surviving population you can see is less genetically diverse than the original population. We've got no representatives of orange. One reason it's important to understand the bottleneck effect is that human activities, such as overhunting and destroying habitats, can create severe bottlenecks for other species. Examples of species that are affected by bottlenecks include the endangered Florida panther, the African cheetah, and the greater prairie chicken. Genetic drift is also likely when a few individuals colonize an island or other new habitat, producing what is called the founder effect. The smaller the group, the less likely the genetic makeup of the new colonist will represent the gene pool of the original larger population they left. The founder effect will explain the relatively high frequency of certain inherited disorders among some human populations established by, by small numbers of colonists. Gene flow. Allele frequencies in a population can also change as a result of gene flow, where a population may gain or lose alleles when fertile individuals move into or out of the population, or when gametes, such as plant pollen, are transferred between populations. 
gene flow tends to reduce the differences between the populations because of the mixing. To counteract the lack of genetic diversity in the remaining Illinois greater prairie chickens, researchers added 271 birds from neighboring states to the Illinois populations, which successfully introduced new alleles. This actually worked. New alleles entered the population and the egg hatching rate improved more than 90%. Genetic drift, gene flow, and mutations can each result in microevolution, but only by chance could these events improve a population's fit to its environment. In natural selection, only the genetic variation produced by mutation and sexual reproduction results from random events. The process of natural selection, where some individuals are more likely than others to survive and reproduce, is not random. Because of this sorting, only natural selection consistently will lead to adaptive evolution. The adaptations of organisms include many striking examples. For example, some of the features that make the blue-footed booby suited to its home on the Galapagos Islands. This cute bird has large webbed feet that are really good flippers, propelling the bird through the water at very high speeds. Its body and bill are very streamlined, minimizing friction as it dives from heights up to 75 feet, up to over 75 feet, into the shallow water below. And when the bird hits the high speed, hits the water at this high speed, the booby will use its large tail as a brake. So here he is with this little cute feet. So the commonly used phrases struggle for existence and survival of the fittest can be misleading if we take them to mean direct competition between individuals. Reproductive success is generally more subtle and passive. Relative fitness is the contribution of an individual that an individual makes to the gene pool of the next generation relative to the contributions of other individuals. Natural selection can affect the distribution of phenotypes or the physical expression of those genes in a population. Stabilizing selection will favor intermediate phenotypes. Directional selection will shift the overall makeup of the population by acting against individuals at one of the phenotypic extremes. And disruptive selection will occur when environmental conditions vary in a way that favors individuals at both ends of a phenotypic range over individu individuals with intermediate phenotypes. So let's see what that means by looking at this. So here is our frequency of individuals, and here are our phenotypes, our colors of fur in these individuals. And when we have selection, we talked about we can have stabilizing, directional, or disruptive. So here's stabilizing selection, where we're going to choose the intermediate, not choose, we're going to favor the intermediate phenotype. So intermediate meaning kind of the in-between. And you can see that the evolved population has favored the intermediate phenotype. So the middle fur color. Directional selection shifts the overall makeup of the population by acting against individuals at one of the phenotypic extremes. So selection has acted against the lighter colored fur, favoring the darker fur, which is one example of the phenotypic extreme. So we had an extreme at both ends, very light and very dark, and we have favored the dark extreme. Disruptive selection is when environmental conditions vary in a way that favors individuals at both of the phenotypic ends 
really reducing the immediate or intermediate phenotype. So we've got a selection for the light and the dark, but not so much the in-between. Sexual selection is a form of natural selection where individuals with certain characteristics are more likely than others to obtain mates. In many types of animal species, males and females may have some secondary sexual characteristics that are noticeable differences not associated with their reproduction or survival. This is called sexual dimorphism. So you can definitely see sexual dimorphism in this image. The male peacock is clearly much more vibrant and beautifully colored than this female. So big visible physical differences between the male and the female. In some species, individuals compete directly with members of the same sex for mates. This type of sexual selection is called intrasexual selection, which means within the same sex, most often the males. These contests can involve physical combat, but are more often ritualized displays. So here's an example of physical contact. So clearly, whoever wins this battle will get a chance to be with the female. In a more common type of sexual selection, called intersexual selection, between sexes or mate choice, individuals of one sex, usually the females, are choosy in selecting their mates. What is the advantage to females being choosy? Well, one hypothesis is that females prefer male traits that are correlated with good genes. In other words, the females want the genes that will give them the healthiest children or healthiest offspring. Again, this, this is not a, a conscious want. This is just sort of what that hypothesis is saying. In several bird species, research has shown that traits preferred by females, such as bright beaks or long tails, are related to overall male health. The good genes hypothesis was also tested with gray tree frogs. Female frogs prefer to mate with males that give longer mating calls. Antibiotics are drugs that kill infectious microorganisms. And during the 1950s, some medical experts even thought the age of human infectious disease would soon be over. Why didn't that actually come true? Well, it didn't really take into account the force of evolution. In the same way that pesticides select for resistant insects, antibiotics select for resistant bacteria. Again, we see both the random and non-random aspects of natural selection. The random genetic mutations in bacteria and the non-random selective effects as the environment favors the antibiotic-resistant phenotype. How do we contribute to the problem of antibiotic resistance? Many doctors overprescribe antibiotics. Patients may also misuse the antibiotics by prematurely stopping taking their medication because they start to feel better. Livestock producers add antibiotics to animal feed as a growth promoter and to prevent illness. Each year in the United States, Nearly 100,000 people die from infections they contract in the hospital, often because the bacteria are resistant to multiple antibiotics. A formidable superbug known as MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, can cause flesh-eating disease and potentially fatal systemic whole-body infections. This concludes chapter 13. We'll see you in chapter 14.